today I have the privilege of introducing to you, you may have seen him once before, he actually came here and led worship. Uh, this is my friend Donnie Todd, he's been a friend to me for pretty much my entire time in ministry. We met back in my Van Buren days, he served at Community Bible Church there and uh, he's been a missionary in Tajikistan. Y'all are going to get to hear, all right, all about that he's done. And so uh, it is our pleasure as a church. We get to help sponsor uh, him and his work with Center for Missions Mobilization. So if you would, put your hands together and welcome Donnie Todd. Well, thanks, Jason. You've definitely been a better friend to me than I have to you for sure. And, uh, man, I just love that guy and his family so much. I'm so, if, if you get to hang around him, you know what I'm talking about and He's been with me through some very dark times and some great times in life and got to share about that. But one thing I know about him is he loves you. And he prays for you and he intercedes for you. And he cares deeply about God, hearing God's voice, and how God is leading you as a community of people with a great staff and great leadership and a great community of people here today. He cares so deeply about that. Well, as I, as I began in early days, we were doing student ministry together way back in the day. I feel, I was telling somebody the other day that I, I'm now at the age when I thought, I was, I'm now at the age when I thought my parents were old. So I'm that age. <laughs> and uh, it doesn't feel like it. I don't feel like I'm 25 anymore, but I do recognize as I get out of bed in the morning or come back from a trip that I don't recover quite as quickly as I used to. But I would, I would, early on, as I was listening to different teachers and preachers and speakers speak, I would try to, you know, glean from them and how they would teach. And I loved Francis Chan. He's, I always appreciate his heart for the gospel, his heart for the nations. Um, and, uh, but one thing he would do oftentimes, he'd get up in front of the people and he'd say, well, I just really need you to pray for me today. I don't know what I'm going to speak about today. And everybody would laugh. He said, no, really. I don't know what I'm going to speak about today. And I'd be like, did he not prepare? I mean, like, is he just showing up? Is he just winging it? Or what's going on? Now he was prepared. But as I get older, I understand a little bit more what he's talking about. Every place is different. Every group of people is different. Every moment is different. Every church is different. Every situation is different. And so he wanted to walk in recognizing the Spirit's lead and direction in that moment. So if you would do that with me today, I have prepared. <laughs> I am ready. But I also want us as a community of people to say, God, give us ears to hear, hearts that are open, lives that are ready to listen, what you would have to speak to us individually, but also as a church, a community of people today. So as Jason said, I spent some time in Tajikistan, and something I learned from the Tajik believers that I really love and I've taken uh, and put into practice in my own life is this, as they would pray, they would extend their hands out like this with palms facing upward. One is a position of, position of surrender to God, but also with open hands ready to receive what God would have for them. So if you do me a favor today, whether you stand or you sit or you kneel where you are, would you just extend your hands out today with me? As we surrender ourselves to God and the leading of his spirit and his word, become ready to receive what God has for us today. I'm going to read this passage, this prayer in Ephesians chapter 3. Would you pray with me? For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, that he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Five years ago, 
I found myself walking into my lead pastor's office. I said, I, I need help. I'm in a really dark spot. I'm depressed. And I don't know what to do. And uh, it was a really humbling moment for me. Because six months before that, we got back from Tajikistan. Tajikistan, and I thought I was Superman. While we were there, we saw God do amazing things. We were, we were witnesses to things that are truly inexplicable. But also during that time under culture stress, I found the ugliness of who I am and how I processed stress and my anger, and my desire to please other people, putting ministry before my family, my anger, depression, the highs were high, the mountains were high, literally. The country is 78% mountains. And the valleys were low, and the distance in between was exhausting. Why is this prayer in Ephesians important? Because God and his spirit is powerful to change us in our innermost being. Well, just a little background on Ephesians. I'm going to shorten this up from what I did earlier in the first service. But you guys have been going through Acts a little bit, and so you can go back and read Acts chapter 19 to see how Paul got to Ephesus. Ephesus was the epicenter of worship for Greek and Roman gods. There were temples all throughout the city. There were priests and priestesses who would accept sacrifices and offerings of the people for whatever reason they needed to these gods. And the missionary apostle Paul had a thriving two-year ministry in the city of Ephesus where people from all different multi-ethnic backgrounds became followers of Jesus. So the book of Ephesians is written by Paul as he's imprisoned in Rome. So we can divide the book of Ephesians into two parts. Part one is chapters one through three. This word, therefore, and then chapters four through six. Chapters 1 through 3, Paul starts off with this beautiful Jewish poem, praising God the Father for what he's done through Christ Jesus. And he begins to talk about how God purposed from the foundations of time to establish a covenant people. Think Abraham, Genesis 12, 1 through 3. That through him, through Abraham, God would bless all nations. And that ultimately in Jesus, this blessing would result in non-Jews, Gentiles, and Jewish people alike being brought together in Christ Jesus into this multi-ethnic, beautiful family of his followers. So then Paul goes on and he talks more about this and he, he has this prayer that they would, be so, they would so experience the gospel that it would radically change their lives and that they would be filled with the very spirit of God, the very power of God, that raised Christ Jesus from the dead. Now that's a prayer. <laughs> what would that be like? This grace would open up a new way to understand God's plan to redeem all peoples to himself. Jewish people and non-Jewish people to alike were part of that non-Jewish crowd. To experience the Holy Spirit, to unify us together into this new multi-ethnic community and family of faith. In the first part of chapter 3, Paul talks about how he is uniquely situated to share and articulate the mystery of God and his role to go into the Gentiles, to those that haven't yet heard the gospel, see that come to fruition. And that sets up this prayer in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. Well, I don't get to do life alone. We all don't do life alone, but sometimes we isolate ourselves. So this is a picture of my family. Here they are. That's who I get to do life with. On the very left is my daughter, Liv. 
She's a freshman in college at Oklahoma Baptist University. She's studying nursing, and she has a great love for God, a contagious personality. She's a leader. She also is in, in, uh, involved in missional things as well. The second beautiful woman is my wife, Rachel. She asks the best questions in the world, and she's able to get to meaningful conversations with people, and she remembers those things, and she is one of the most caring and loving, godly people that I know. She gets to live with me. <laughs> and then over on the right of me is my son, Pierce. He's a sophomore in high school. He's in the marching band. And let me tell you, marching bands are not like when I was in high school. It's amazing what they do, marching around the field in different formations and different show. Um, he's right now in St. Louis coming back from a competition there. It's, it's really fun to watch him and to see him develop as a musician and also use those uh, to glorify God and worship. And then my youngest son, Shepard, um, he is an eighth grader and also involved in band. He's a percussionist, so he's like steel over there. And he loves to bang on the drums all day. I don't want to work. I just want to bang on the drums all day. might be his theme song. Uh, but uh, he loves it. He also uses it to, to lead others in worship of God. But this is who I get to do life with. I don't get to do life alone. So I don't know who you do life with. But a little bit more about my story is I grew up. Uh, my dad was in the military, so we moved uh, 15 times in 18 years before I went off to college. It's a lot of moving, that's a lot of people, that's a lot of friends, but it's also great to say goodbye to all those enemies throughout the years. We lived all over the world, and when I was 13 years old, I found myself on the top of a mountain in Switzerland. Um, I was a new believer. My parents were really new in their faith uh, from 7 to 10 years old, is watching them grow in this vibrancy of following Jesus. So I was new in my faith as a Christ follower, and I uh, found myself at the top of this mountain worshiping God, looking around at his beautiful, amazing creation, just totally inexplicable, and something happened to me that had never happened before, as God spoke directly to my heart in that moment. He said, Donnie, I want you to serve me. And a value that was placed in me early on as a Christ follower is just obedience, simple, faithful obedience. That's how we evaluate our lives as a family is by faithfulness, and by obedience. How can you move mountains? Sometimes it's not throwing the whole mountain into the sea, but sometimes it's one shovel at a time. So God evaluates us also on faithfulness. And so I found God saying, I want you to follow me. And I said, God, wherever you want me to go, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I just want to be obedient. I moved when I was 15 to high school. And there, uh, these insecurities kind of really reared their ugly head as a teenager. I was really insecure with the way I looked. Didn't like, I was super skinny. I was short at that time. I didn't even weigh 100 pounds. I couldn't even lift the bar. So I tried to compensate in so many other ways. And this would begin a time of where my life became based on trying to please other people. And, and my happiness was based on what other people thought about me. When I was 16, a missionary came and spoke to our church about the Maasai people. And I know uh, that uh, y'all support a lady, Miss Rhonda Baxter, who has worked with the Maasai people and also uh, cares for people around the world. Um, but this missionary was talking about this, this people group who had never heard the gospel, now have seen the gospel come into this, to this group of people who was a warring, violent tribe of people. And they had put down the spear, picked up the word of God, were now, instead of sharing violence, they were sharing God's peace through Jesus with one another. And God, again, spoke right to my heart. Donnie, I want you to go to peoples who don't have access to the gospel. I want you to go to peoples who have never heard about me. And I said, God, whatever you want me to do, wherever you want me to go, I'll go. And after that great high moment in my life, the enemy of my soul began to sink his teeth into me, whisper those lies of insecurities into my mind and my heart. And instead of listening to the great shepherd's voice, I began to listen to this other voice who had no other desire than to steal, kill, and destroy all that was good in my life. And just like the country song says, I looked for love in all the wrong places. I tried to be the funny guy because I wanted to distract people from the deep insecurity I had with my physical appearance. I hung out with all the in crowd thinking that maybe... I would be seen and heard, but didn't know that none of that truly satisfied. 
Physical relationships with girls only brought me an unbearable pain of shame and guilt. I lied to my parents and my friends about where I was. The weight of all this was eating me from the inside out. It was exhausting to try to keep up the appearance of being the good guy. I isolated myself emotionally, and I was in a really dark place trying to hide and numb all the shame and guilt that I had collected during this season of my life. But God. But God. Only God could weave my story back together. As an 18-year-old, I found myself on the lawn at Oklahoma Baptist University hearing this unknown guy at the time named Louis Giglio speak to us as freshmen in college. And he said one of the most fortune cookie preacher statements that I had ever heard. But in that moment, God was speaking directly to me. Louis said, I think there's somebody here today who was crushed under the weight of their guilt and shame. And God so wants to deliver you from that today. And in that moment, I just stood up with all these people I had just met. And I walked over to a guy that I literally met the day before who was in the room next to me. And I began just to bear my soul to him. But God. But God. And his grace and his mercy, like Paul talks about in the first part of Ephesians I thought that these calls that God had placed on my life that I had thrown away, I couldn't do those anymore because I was broken. I was steeped in shame, and I was now destined to live this less than life. But God, in that moment, he stripped away all that shame and guilt that I had heaped upon myself, and he allowed me to see a picture underneath, and it said this, deeply loved child of God. He just reminded me that as Christ followers, we are so deeply loved, just like the songs that we're talking about. You guys have an incredible worship team. It can lead you to God's heart and his love and understanding. So in that moment, God reminded me that I'm a deeply loved child of God, and that my sin is cast as far as east is from the west. That I'm not destined for some less than plan B life. That God has a great purpose for me. That he can redeem me. And he can reconcile me. And he can restore me. And he can fill me with his spirit. To accomplish his great purposes in this world. So in college I met my wife Rachel. And... Uh, she also had this great call in her life, and we both had this kind of filter, not kind of a filter, that whoever we would marry one day would also have this perspective in mind that there was a great desire to go to people who hadn't yet heard the hope of Jesus, and that maybe they could experience what I had experienced too, that they are a deeply loved child of God, brought together in this wonderful covenant family that Jesus brought together of multi-ethnic background of people. There's this verse that began to shape our lives. It's in Romans 10, 13 through 17. And it says this, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him who they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him who they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us. So faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So Tajikistan is situated um, just above Afghanistan, directly west of China. And that verse, I said, shaped Rachel and I's life and... Um, there was a problem that we were confronted with that we just had to do something about. And that, that, there, that there's people around this globe who still have no access to the gospel. There's no Christian close by. There's no way. Like, we can go to the faucet and get clean water. But what would it be like if they had no ability to get water? They have no access to the living water. So without somebody going, without somebody being sent, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. <laughs> 
So these three billion people around the globe who still have no access to the gospel, how do we do something like that? How do we do something about that? I didn't know where to start. There's an old uh, story about an old man and a younger man who are walking on the beach. And as they're walking, there's thousands of starfish that have washed up on the shore. And uh, you've probably, you may have heard this story before, but the old man picks up one of these starfish and he throws it in the ocean, throws it back into the ocean. He walks up to the next one and he throws that next starfish into the ocean and the next one and the next one. And the young man's like, what are you doing? There's no way you're going to be able to save all these starfish. What do you, what, why do you even try? As he picks up the next one, he says, well, it matters to this one. And it matters to this one. And it matters to this one. From whom every family in heaven on earth is named. It matters to each and every tribe and every tongue and nation. We all matter to God. So how do we do it? One starfish at a time. Up on the screen here is uh, a picture um, that you guys were a part of, but you may not have realized it. As you've prayed for me and my family, and as we were serving in Tajikistan uh, for a season in 2014 to 2017, I found myself six months into the country on the other side of the camera taking this picture. And what's happening here is this. The guy right here in blue in the middle is a strong, devoted believer of Jesus who's encountered much persecution in his life. And to the right of him is a man in a very northern part of the country of Tajikistan. And this village is an unreached peoples, but there's also this other term which I saw out in your lobby that you all have talked about, I think, as well. There's this term unengaged. There's no missionary presence There's no church presence at all anywhere close by. But in this particular village, the gospel had not ever yet come. To their knowledge, no person had come before this. And so um, here in this picture is uh, a man with something in his ear. And what he's doing is hearing the word of God for the very first time in his life as a 52-year-old man. And he begins to weep. What comes out of his mouth is this. This is the most beautiful thing that I have ever heard. How often have I taken for granted that I can go to the word and and read it at any point in time. And he is tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. As he's hearing the word of God for the very first time, and it has such great impact that it's affecting his innermost being. You all were a part of that. You're one of the starfish as he becomes a Christ follower. As people who support me and my family, but also as you support teams around the globe. There's five habits of a world-minded Christian. We pray, like this prayer that Paul prays with us in Ephesians We send others. You all have sent out other peoples from this church, the peoples around the globe. You go yourselves, starting here in Poto, Oklahoma, and eventually to the ends of the earth. You welcome other peoples. Sometimes we don't have to always go to the nations. Sometimes the nations come to us. So I know there's plenty of international students that come here to the university and college here in town. What would it be like to welcome them into this community, even to this community of faith? They can hang around people who are rooted and grounded in God's love. That in the chaos and tumult of their lives, that they can have this brief time or this short time to spend time with you and your family and your homes and in this community of people. And they say, hey, man, you know what? The chaos around me is, is something different, but there is a sense of peace and groundedness and love that these people have for one another. Jesus says, they will know you're my disciples by how you love one another. What would it be like for us to welcome people from other nations, but also just people from our community as well, into our homes, into this community, this covenant community of faith? And then finally, we mobilize others. What is it like to help people understand that God has a great purpose for all of his Christ followers? make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that God has commanded. 
something that God calls all of us to do. To find our place in praying, sending, going, welcoming, and mobilizing. That's how we play our part. That's how we be obedient, that faithful, one shovel, one starfish at a time. This, uh, this, the next slide is, is a, a group here as well. So this is a pretty cool story. I actually didn't know the end of this, the, the last part of this story until just a few months ago as my wife and I, um, after time of just being restored and serving in our faithfully back in our home church in Fort Smith. Um, but uh, we heard this from some, uh, some Wycliffe Bible pe- people um, who are missionaries in this part of the world. And um, so this is the story. So when I was there in 2017, uh, as we were wrapping up our time there, we encountered this group of people called the Paria people. It was really fascinating, too, because I'd never encountered a people group before who had never had a written language. So they had no written language Everything, every part of their culture was oral, orally, translate, or orally transmitted from generation to generation. So all their history, all their stories, all their poems, nothing written down. So this group comes in and helps them to begin to develop a, an alphabet and letters that make sounds. A is for apple, B is for boy, and this only oral language now becomes written. And so I helped them develop an alphabet book and have some graphics stuff in the background in my history. And so we helped them develop this, this, uh, this alphabet book. And I was pretty cool process to be a part of. And so then my family wraps up. We leave Tajikistan. And that's the last that I knew of the Paria people for a while. Um, Paria people are also an unreached, unengaged people who had never had access to the gospel before. Um, the, I just got to be a part of some cool things that God was doing. I had no bearing on any of these things. I just got to hang out with some really cool people like Horshed here, who just devoted Christ followers who experienced persecution. He, he's lost several businesses. He's been ostracized by family. He goes to minority peoples all throughout the country of Tajikistan and Russia, uh, sharing the hope that he has in Jesus very boldly. Um, and he, he just uh, experiences persecution in a way that I never would understand. Um, but the Paria people here, uh, the story continues. So as, my, as we reconnected with some friends of ours as we were trying to find a new missions organization um, a few months ago, um, they uh, said this, hey, Donnie, have you heard about the Paria people? And I was like, no, man, I, I haven't. Tell me about it. Like, I, last thing I remember is the alphabet book. And like, oh, man, we've got a story to tell you. This Horshed and some other guys were continually faithful to, to share the gospel within that community, but... The leader of the village was a very devout, strict Muslim, very well respected in his community. The Paria people were, were kind of looked down in, in Tajikistan. They were, they were immigrants that had come up from Bangladesh a long time ago, and so they were a little less than people, and so Tajiks didn't really try to associate with them too much. The leader of the village was very well respected, and so he... Uh, began to be involved in this translation project. So he helped them develop the alphabet, and as he would speak, they would, try to, they would form this alphabet. And then in the process, he began to translate all the stories of the Paria history. They wrote all those down. They began to translate some Bible stories. And so that's what they do is they help kind of translate some Bible stories as they, as they get into these villages and connect with people. And then began to translate the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And one day he walked into the translation director's office and he shut the door and she gets really nervous because culturally that's a big no-no. She's a woman, she's a Westerner, and he shut the door. But he says, I have to tell you something. She gets really nervous (laughs) because she's like, what, did the KGB find out? Are they going to kick us out of the country? Are we going to get in trouble? Are they going to come arrest me? What's going to go on? And he says, I believe. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. What do I have to do to follow him? As he encountered God's word, as he was translating the gospels, Jesus just came alive to him. He said, I got to follow him. What do I got to do? She helps him to understand what it means to follow Jesus. He said, can I bring my wife in tomorrow? She's like, well, you know, you can help her understand. I, I want to bring my wife in tomorrow. So he brings his wife in. She becomes a Christ follower the next day. The next day, they said, can we bring our sons in? They want to follow Jesus. Can you help us? Like, well, you you can do this. You're like, well, okay. So they bring their sons in. They commit to follow Jesus. So just like early in the book of Acts, when you see households coming to faith, this was happening among the Pari people. It's been happening among the Pari people. So 
The same guy I showed you earlier, uh, here, uh, passing on the word of God to somebody else, baptizes the leader of this village. Now there's 20 people baptized in, among the party of people and 40 people who meet in a house church on a regular basis, and you all were a part of that. So in Revelation chapter 7, when it says, a multitude of people from every tribe and tongue and nation standing before the Savior in heaven, the Paria people are one of those people. And I don't know if it would happen, but maybe they would come up to you and say thank you for whatever part that you played in us and our eternity being changed forever. We are eternally grateful to know the hope that we have in Jesus So how do we play our part in these three billion people who have no access to the gospel? So we just joined an organization called the Center for Mission Mobilization, and, and here's the reality. That how, do you, how do you reach three billion people with the gospel? Well, we can't do it by ourselves. We have this multi-ethnic, big body of people that we're a part of. And so if you look at this, these charts here, 80% of the evangelical believers actually live outside the global West. That's Latin America, Africa, and Asia. There are more believers outside of the global West than there are uh, inside the global West. But upwards of 80% of missionaries and resources get sent from the global West. So what would it be like if this 80% was mobilized to go specifically to these unreached peoples, to these 3 billion people? Jesus says, don't pray for the harvest. It's plentiful. But pray that more laborers would go into the field. So doesn't it just make sense that we go to these 80% to help them understand that God has a heart to redeem all peoples to himself, to discover what their role is in that, and to train, develop, and send out and, and, and resource from their own churches missionaries specifically to people that don't have access to the gospel. That's what I get to be a part of. And it's a beautiful thing to see Venezuelans going to the Middle East. It's a beautiful thing that last month, 100 Egyptian pastors were gathered together to understand what it's like to, to come alongside people to help them discover God's heart from Genesis through Revelation and, and through Bible studies, to, that God has a plan to redeem all people to himself, to understand what their role is in that, and then to train people to go specifically to these unreached countries. And so these 100 Egyptian pastors... They're saying, hey, we want to commit to send people from our church to the Middle East. We speak Arabic. Our culture is really a lot closer to theirs than, than others. And so what would it be like for us to send, train, fund missionaries from the Egyptian church to the Middle East? These 80% are being mobilized. More workers or laborers are sent out to the field. My wife says, makes this analogy. It's not an either or, but it's a both and. God still needs people from the West to go to these unreached peoples. But what would it be like to go somewhere else and wake up 100 sleeping fire people? 100 more people besides just little old me. God is multiplying his work throughout the nations to redeem all peoples to himself. So just real quick. To, to talk a little bit more about this. This is uh, all the countries that have at least one million or more believers in them. And these are, pe these are areas that are being mobilized to send missionaries specifically to unreached peoples. And this next slide is this. This is all this, where those three billion people live who don't have access to the gospel. So one story of the many is that uh, Center for Mission Mobilization, the organization I work with, I talked about the Egyptian pastors, but the largest church in London, England, is actually the Nigerian church. I had no idea. <laughs> but if you look at Nigeria in the context of the rest of Africa, it's down in the middle. It has that diamond in it. And so it's a mixture of people who are unreached with the gospel, people that don't have access to the gospel, with people who do have access to the gospel. But if you look in context to the countries around it, there's so many countries that are unreached that are just right next door. So what is it like now for the Nigerians to be mobilized, to send out, train, fund, resource missionaries from the Nigerian church to go to these countries next? Their cultures are a lot more similar. Geopolitically, it's tough for Westerners to get in places. Financially, they're sending people. Uh, it costs a lot less for them to go one country over than it does from different parts of the world to next door. So God is using 
Nigerians, Venezuelans, Brazilians, uh, Peruvians, and other people from that 80% of the world to send missionaries specifically to people like the Paria, people who have no access to the gospel. And you all are a part of that. So, how do we multiply ourselves? Where do we find ourselves today? What is God saying to us today? This prayer in Ephesians. What would it be like for Cross Community to be so rooted and grounded in God's love that the city of Poto would go, hey, you know that Cross Community Church, they love people so well. They just care for one another. Just like early in the book of Acts when people were empowered by God's Spirit, the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead, that you would just... Love one another in such a way as you devote yourself to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, breaking bread, and prayer, that as people were welcomed into your homes, they would experience love and peace like never before. They say, hey, I want to be part of that family, that covenant family of multi-ethnic people from all around the world. I want to be part of that family. That's only possible through the power of God's Spirit. And just like this prayer in Ephesians chapter 3, No matter your background, God can redeem that. God can restore you. You say, Donnie, you don't know what I've done. It doesn't matter. It does matter. But God, but God, can do something about that and remind you that you are a deeply loved child of God and that you have your role and you have your place in this great plan that God has to redeem all peoples to himself into this covenant, beautiful family that he has brought to us through Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection. So is God speaking to your heart today? Is he saying, let down that shame and guilt? Is he saying, hey, I want you to follow me? How can we respond with open hands and open hearts today, empowered by God's spirit as a community of faith? Let's pray. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven on earth is named. According to the glorious the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.